Hey guys, Yoiston here with a video that I've been wanting to make for quite some time. Today we'll be taking a look at the two Middle Earth games, Shadow of Mordor and especially Shadow of War. The former released in September of 2014, and the latter in November of 2017. However, as this is a lore-based channel that looks at Tolkien's works, we are only going to concentrate on the lore aspects of both games, as we explore the major differences between the storylines, characters, and settings in these games, and how it holds up against the actual canon of Tolkien's Legendarium. So I must say that there are going to be massive spoilers ahead for both of these games. This isn't a full review of the games, their mechanics, or gameplay, but rather it is us looking at how the lore of both games hold up in Tolkien's universe. And unfortunately, it does not hold up well in my opinion. Let's get into it. First, let's go through a quick summary of the plots in both games. In Shadow of Mordor, taking place in the 60-year gap between the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, you play as Talion, a captain of Gondor set to watch Mordor on the Black Gate, with his brothers at arms. Their watch is attacked, however, by the Black Hand of Sauron, one of the Dark Lord's top lieutenants, resulting in Talion's near death and the death of his family. They are sacrificed by the Black Hand to try to summon the wraith of the elf Celebrimbor into himself. However, the elf is imbued into Talion, bringing the Captain of the Guard back from the dead. After this, Shadow of Mordor is a revenge tale of Talion and Celebrimbor against Sauron, the Black Hand and their forces. Along the way, you meet Gollum, Queen Marwyn, who rules Nern, and some other beings that help you along your quest. In the end, Celebrimbor helps Talion defeat the Black Hand and destroy the physical form of Sauron. The game ends with Talion looking at Mount Doom while declaring his desire to forge a new ring of power. The second game, Shadow of War, picks up right where the first game left off. In Mount Doom, Talion and Celebrimbor forge a new ring, an inverted one ring, basically. However, soon after, Celebrimbor is abducted by Shelob, the daughter of Ungoliant, who exchanges Celebrimbor for Talion's ring. At this point in the game, Shelob takes the guise of a fair woman, rather than the spider that we all know her as. She claims that they have a common enemy in Sauron who has betrayed her in the past. Using the new Ring of Power, Shelob looks into the future and convinces Talion to go to Minas Ithil, later known as Menas Morgul, to recover the Palantir. After coming to the fortress, Talion wants to save his fellow Gondorians, while Celebrimbor wants only to save the Palantir. In the fighting, the city general named Castamir betrays his people and lets the Witch King's armies through the gates. Talion is able to escape with the help of Eltariel, an elven assassin working for Galadriel. The Witch King seizes the city and renames it Menas Morgul. Using the Palantir, the Witch King finds that Shelob holds Celebrimbor's new ring of power, and he sends his Nazgul forth to attack her. Talion saves Shelob and the ring of power is returned to him. Shelob tells him that the fate of Middle-earth is in his hands. Using the ring, Talion turns an army of orcs, assists Gondorian survivors, and helps the forest god Karnan defeat a Balrog raised by an orc necromancer, while also hunting the Nazgul. After assembling enough power, Talion assaults Menas Morgul and defeats Asildor, who cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand, as he is now a Nazgul. I know, I can't believe it either. We'll get back to that in a second. Upon seeing how Asildor was corrupted, Talion decides to destroy Asildor and release his spirit, rather than corrupt him with his ring. Celebrimbor is angry at this decision, and Talion realizes that Celebrimbor wants to take Sauron's place, rather than end his tyranny. So, Celebrimbor and his ring leave Talion to take Eltariel instead. Without Celebrimbor, Talion begins to die, and he is visited by Shelob in a vision, who says that if he and Celebrimbor had fought Sauron, Celebrimbor would have enslaved Sauron and marched upon the rest of Middle-earth. Shelob then implores Talion, to continue the fight against Sauron. So Talion picks up Asildor's ring to preserve his life. Using his power, he defeats the Witch King and takes the city and the Palantir. In the Palantir, he sees Eltariel, Celebrimbor, and Sauron fight, resulting in an everlasting conflict of their spirits, creating a flaming eye upon Barad-dûr. Talion decides to use Menas Ithil to stay Sauron's forces in Mordor, but falls inevitably into becoming a Nazgul. 
Eventually, he is defeated with the others after the One Ring is destroyed at the end of the War of the Ring, and Talion finally finds peace. So, now that we know both the plot of Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War, we can look at how it holds up in a lore perspective when you consider all of Tolkien's works together. Now, this is my opinion, and if you have a similar or differing opinion, please let me know in the comments, or make a video response. I'd really enjoy watching it. Again, I can't stress enough how much I value each and every one of you and your opinions, so I would really like to see what you guys have to say. In my opinion, these games are not respectful to their source material of Tolkien's Legendarium for quite a few reasons. If we look at our protagonists, Talion being a captain, watching over a beautiful looking Mordor isn't strictly correct, as the Nazgul re-entered Mordor in 1856 of the Third Age, and they fully retook all of Mordor in 1944. They also retook Minas Ithil in 2002 of the Third Age, making the main plot of Shadow of War nonsensical, as these events happened almost a thousand years before Talion's time. As for Celebrimbor, in the Legendarium, this elf is determined and intelligent, yes, but he is also very kind and trusting, which is what got him conquered by Sauron. He didn't have a family, but was rather somewhat in love with Galadriel. Celebrimbor and the other Noldor under his command created 19 of the 20 Rings of Power. And after the creation of the One Ring by Sauron alone, Celebrimbor was killed in the War of the Elves and Sauron, almost 1500 years before the War of the Last Alliance, where he is originally killed in the game. So, from a lore perspective, these two characters coming together out of death and vengeance is absurd, making their adventures even more so, as 60 years before the Lord of the Rings, the Nazgul had Mordor ready for Sauron's return. For an elf and man to become united after or near death doesn't make sense in the context of the lore, as Tolkien established that men's spirits are not bound to the fate of Arda, Thus they are free to go beyond the halls of Mandos. The elves are, however, and they stay in the halls of Mandos. For Celebrimbor to come back and save Talion from death doesn't connect with how Tolkien wrote death in his universe. Besides these character, timeline, and setting inconsistencies, Shadow of Mordor works better than its successor in the context of the Legendarium, but it still doesn't work too well. Now that we have looked at the inconsistencies of the first game, let's jump into the second. In the first minutes of the game, a ring to challenge Sauron's One Ring is forged. This in itself is directly inconsistent with Tolkien's lore, as Sauron's ring is called the One Ring for a reason. It controls all other rings and bends its wearer and the wearers of the other rings to the will of Sauron, its maker. For another ring to oppose it directly goes against the fundamentals of the Legendarium. I know that Talion tries to use it for good, but Shelob says that under the right bearers, Sauron could have been defeated by that ring and its masters. Even without the One Ring, Sauron wouldn't be able to be defeated by any ring of power. In the Legendarium, the ideas of Ringcraft itself came to the Elves and Celebrimbor from Sauron, so it would only make sense that Sauron and his ring would have dominance over the others. Next, we look at Shelob, and I get where they're trying to go with her, but again, it doesn't really fit in Tolkien's universe. The developers claim that Shelob is able to shapeshift because she and her mother are dark spirits, as they say. But in the lore, Shelob's mother is Ungoliant, who comes from the void beyond the world of Arda. She chose to take the shape of a spider for her time in Arda, and in that time she would mother many spiders, Shelob being the greatest among them. It would make more sense for Ungoliant to be a shapeshifter than Shelob, as she is an ally of Melkor from the darkness beyond the world. But Shelob herself was born as a spider, and we have no indication that she is able to transform into something else. Thus her role shouldn't be the prophet, as she is in the game, and she should just remain a spider, like in the Legendarium. By this logic, all of the spiders in Mirkwood that we see in The Hobbit should be able to shapeshift as well as they are related to Shelob and Ungoliant, and that would just be absurd. Moving on, rather than being a god or vala, Karnan is a river meaning red water, not what the game claims to be a forest god. The closest being that we have to that in the Legendarium is Arume, though there may have been copyright issues with this one. Also, there's no Balrog in Mordor, or at least none that we know of. And in Middle-earth, there would never be an orc with the power of necromancy, especially not power enough to summon forth a Balrog, as that goes beyond the rules that Tolkien has set for his literature. 
which is something I'll come back to. Now onto the Nazgul, and there isn't much more I can say that hasn't already been said by reviewers and Tolkien fans already, but I would add that the timeline isn't correct at all. First, the Haradrim Soladan, who becomes a Nazgul, doesn't actually bother me that much, as I imagine that at least one of the Nazgul came from Harad. However, the story of his downfall is very reminiscent of ar Farazan, the last king of Numenor who Sauron corrupted. Soladan is not a canonical Nazgul, but for me his story works and is respectful enough to the lore. However, turning Helm Hammerhand and Isildur into Nazgul is very, very disrespectful to the lore if you ask me. The Nazgul were first seen in 2251 of the Second Age, while Isildur was born in 3209 of the Second Age and died in the year 2 of the Third Age, while Helm was born in the year 2691 of the Third Age and died in the year 2759, less than 300 years before the Lord of the Rings, but more than 3000 years after the appearance of the Nazgul. The timelines don't match up, they couldn't have been Nazgul. And the story with Helm killing his daughter never happened, rather he killed Freka, the leader of the Dunlendings, with one punch from his fist, thus earning his name, and Freka's son Wolf marched on Rohan, again, very different from the games. To that end, the Nazgul were already established before the births and deaths of Helm and Isildur, and in my opinion it is very disrespectful towards the lore to do this to these heroes and kings. I'll come back to this at the end of the video, but ultimately I would say the developers making these two characters into Nazgul is the largest difference from the lore in both of the games, and to me it is the most upsetting. Finally, we come to the end of Shadow of War, and how that holds up. The fall of Menace Ithil and the rise of Menace Morgul happened a very long time before it does in the game, and Mordor itself had fallen to the Nazgul long before the events of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. After the fall of Numenor, Sauron was no longer able to take a fair guise again, so in his fight with Celebrimbor he should have maintained his armored and evil form, but in the end, both Sauron and Celebrimbor becoming the Eye doesn't really add up, and here's why. If there was a great eye upon Barad-dûr in the books, it was completely Sauron, using the Ithil Palantir to create it. However, in the books, I'm not entirely sure that this flaming eye exists, because there's never an actual affirmation about it, but rather a great many pieces of imagery about eyes, flame, and Sauron. It is possible that Sauron only used his Palantir and saw out of his windows in Barad-dûr to keep an eye on Mordor and the rest of Middle-earth. And as for Talion, his ending in becoming a Nazgul is interesting in my opinion, but in the Legendarium the Nazgul remain the same beings as they always were, trapped in servitude under Sauron, as they cannot be killed but only recloaked. And I'm not sure that they found peace after Sauron's defeat like Talion did, as the final cutscene of the game is him walking into what I assume to be the West while dropping his armor and his weaponry. For me, these are the major differences between the two Shadow games and Tolkien's Legendarium, and even though there are more, these are the largest plot-wise. In my opinion, it is perfectly fine to take liberties when creating a piece of media based on a lore, but the liberty should be respectful of the source material. In Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War, each change became progressively more extreme and disrespectful towards Tolkien's grand and incredible Legendarium. Having Helm and Isildur as Nazgul are the most severe, and learning about what the game did to them was a driving reason for me to want to make this video. In rating the lore of both of these games, I give Shadow of Mordor a 5 out of 10, and Shadow of War a 3 out of 10. Both games have moments of respect towards the source material, the first more than the second, but they both are still disrespectful to the Legendarium through the many liberties that they take. It is possible to make an incredible game that is mostly true and respectful to the lore. Look at the Lord of the Rings Online, for example. They do make changes and add characters such as Mordorith, the False King, Mazog, the heir of Balg and Azog, and others. And they implement these characters in a way that doesn't weaken, but rather strengthens the lore of Tolkien's Legendarium as a whole. And they do this in such a respectful way, respecting both the player and Tolkien. Most importantly, the game remembers what Tolkien's works are all about, and what they mean. Like I mentioned last week, this Legendarium is about nostalgia, hope, courage, and love. Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War forget these themes, and challenge not only the fundamental ideas of Tolkien's works, but these themes as well. 
With the exception of Talion, the characters are about control, dominance, and violence. Even Talion falls to these themes in Becoming a Nazgul. The thing I appreciate most about both Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War is that they do bring attention back to Tolkien's works, but I wish they did it in a far more respectful and true way. There are many tales from Tolkien's Legendarium to be told in movies, video games, and much more, as Tolkien has created such an incredible world for us to enjoy, and hopefully these tales will be told in the right way. If you found enjoyment in these games, that's great, and I'm not trying to reprimand that in any way. But for this Tolkien scholar personally, I believe these games could have, and should have been more responsible with these differences from the source material, and far more respectful to the work that it's based on. Again, Tolkien provides us with a world and a set of literary rules to play by, and it seems that these games forewent and threw out such rules. Hopefully future games based on Tolkien's works will be able to fulfill such desires from us Tolkien fans. Thank you all so much for watching and listening to my thoughts on these two games. If you would like to hear more of my thoughts on why Tolkien's works are so meaningful, I'll leave a link to that video in the description down below. And again, if you're looking for a respectful and a very true adaptation of Tolkien's works, please check out The Lord of the Rings Online. It has been my favorite video game for more than seven years. Please let me know your thoughts on this video and these games down below, and hit that like button if you enjoyed. Share this video with a friend who you think might like it, and subscribe to see my next videos about Tolkien's works. On Facebook and Twitter, I have left polls for video topics that I'll cover in the coming weeks, and which ones I should do first, so if you'd like to vote on those and contact me more directly, join us on those platforms through the links in the description below. Once again, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my friends.